Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFM LP 103.3 in Asheville. This is the Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian radio show broadcasting out of occupied Salagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world. This week, we're sharing two segments. First up, Lorenza Combo Irvin talks about attempts in the 1970s at building a prisoner's union in the United States and parallels with the inside-outside organizing in the USA Today. Lorenzo is an author, black anarchist, organizer, former Black Panther, and former political prisoner based in Kansas City, Missouri. In this segment, he also talks a bit about the ideas of George Jackson, Martin Sostre, and others. Finally, we will hear from Ohio death row prisoner from the Lucasville Uprising case, Bamani Shakur, a.k.a. Keith Lamar. Bamani called us from death row at OSP Youngstown in Ohio. He's accused of crimes related to the 1993 Lucasville Uprising, which he claims innocence of, and has an execution date set for November 16th, 2023. For a little over an hour, we speak about his upbringing, his case, injustices in white supremacist and capitalist America, Bomani's politicization and struggle to find himself, defend his dignity and his life. Big thanks to Revolutionary Abolitionist Movement of NYC for hooking up this chat. More on his case can be found at keithlamar.org on the Facebook page, Justice for Keith Lamar, and at the Twitter account, Free Keith Lamar. On his website, you can find a link to his book, Condemned, and ways to donate to his phone fund. Hey, listeners, just one quick other announcement. Just two quick other announcements. Three, actually. Hey, listeners, just three quick announcements. Eric King is now off of mail ban. You can send him letters. Um, You can send him books, You can find out more about this, get in touch, and get to know him by learning more at supportericking.org. Secondly, um, anarchist political prisoner and Rojava veteran Dan Baker has an online book wish list, which can be found at Anarchist Black Cross Federation's website, abcf.net. We'll link to that specific page in our show notes. And finally, good news about Sean Swain. For the moment, he is back in general population. He has access to the phone, and he is no longer under immediate threat, according to the Attorney General of Ohio, to being shipped off without recourse to Maryland prisons. You can write to Sean Swain at his normal address for the moment uh, in Youngstown, Ohio. We will link that in the show notes as well. I'm sure he'd love some support letters. And um, yeah, stay tuned to hear his voice in upcoming episodes. So yeah, we were talking about the prisoner union, um, uh, and this is the 70s, 1973? Yeah, yeah 73, 74, 75. Uh, actually, all the way up to 77 when the Supreme Court made a ruling that it was unconstitutional. To and so To have a prisoner union? Yeah, they, they ruled it was unconstitutional, the United States Supreme Court. Uh, but by that time, they had uh, signed up thousands of prisoners all over the country in, in different uh, states, you know, that had, that had started their own you know, uh, union there in that state, you know, in the state prisons. Uh, but um, here's the deal, you know, it was it, all this came after the, uh, you know, the Attica Rebellion uh, and, you know, and the, and the massacre there and everything. And the, the anger of the prisoners, you know, took various forms. You know, you had other rebellions and you had strikes and you had, you know, a number of things like that happen in, in local prisons. But then, um, you know, some people organized, the, I think it was in North Carolina as far as I can remember, uh, the original um, prisoners' labor unions was started by a guy named Jim Grant, who was a, who was a civil rights activist and some other prisoners in the in the North Carolina state prison system. Uh, it also was going down in places like, you know, Walpole in um, uh, Massachusetts. And uh, that, that, you know, that movement, of course, was just, you know, the strike. And then after that, uh, and they made contacts with activists on the outside, which is a common thing back in, in the 1970s and the 60s, was to make contacts with activists on the outside, and um, they were able to get some some support from the outside, and so they started they started organizing a union. They didn't ask 
for a union. You know, they didn't say, can we have a union officer, uh, you know, a warden? So, so they just started organizing unions all over. And uh, it, it started just sweeping the country, you know. It, you know, California had a big, big contingent, you know, and everything, and other states as well, you know, and it just started sweeping the country. And, and before long, thousands of prisoners were in these unions, and they were demanding, uh, you know, prisoners' rights. And, they, you know, and they into, uh, you know, this uh, beatings in prison and, and long-term confinement, uh, you know, the de deprival of, the, you know, basic human rights and all this kind of thing. And um, so as it got stronger, it tried to build a central union, you know, and, and um, it was that point that, uh, and this is after some years had gone down and after protests and organizing and people on the outside putting pressure on the government and, and so forth, after all this had gone on, then it just, when they tried to create the central prisoners' labor union, um, you know, that's when the wardens took, took them to prison, you know, the various state wardens uh, and prison wardens and so forth took them to prison, uh, took them to court to, and wound up finally in the United States Supreme Court. I think it was 77 or 78 that they got the decision against uh, the whole idea of, uh, of this, this kind of movement being unconstitutional, they said, and a threat to prison security, you know. So, uh, you know, it was interesting that at that time, many of us, we had a split in our ranks because some of us believed that, you know, going to court and fighting and all this was a good, a good thing to do. And others of us felt like we should just continue organizing and, and, and build the strongest possible movement that could even resist, you know, repression. And um, it, it didn't matter in the final analysis because uh, they just, you know, came down on, on those of us that they thought were leaders and so forth and, you know, and, and just put us away, you know. Now, <clears throat> there's one thing, though, in the in the federal prison system, uh, I met, well, I knew Jim Grant. I met Jim Grant in prison. Uh, they, they shipped him out of North Carolina down to the Atlanta federal prison, and we had started to build a uh, federal prisoner's labor union, trying to do that, you know, and, uh, of course, it was around that time that the decision came down and, and everything, and they isolated a bunch of us and all that. Shit. But here's the deal. The prisoners' labor union, the difference between it and, and, and just the strikers uh, that yeah. we've seen in, in recent years is it recognized, it was, it was hooked up with the black power movement. You know, it was hooked up with the black power movement, the civil rights movement, and other organizations that were on, they're still live on the outside, you know. And, well, uh, that's the question. What, what, yeah. What would, what would you say then of like the need to connect groups like Movement for Black Lives into more radical black organizations that do like grassroots stuff on the outside with the prison movement? You well, I, I, I'll say this, you know, and I, now that requires some study, but uh, I, just off the hand, I would think that uh, the movement, which has to be led by prisoners and the, the movement on the outside, um, has to be, uh, you know, supportive of the prison struggle. Yeah. Um, but like I'd, I'd written, you know, my, myself some time ago about how activists on the outside have got to start pressuring the state governments and, 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 and you know, and the feds and everybody else uh, while the movement on the inside is building, you know. And, and it doesn't just mean standing on the outside with a, with a ticket sign, but, you know, as I've written about going where the officials have their meetings and, and all these corporations that make money off of uh, prison labor, you know, and there are quite a few of them, you know, expose that and you know, some of the stuff that the pre-Alabama movement has started to talk about in this period, uh, we should be doing it that way, you know. Uh, and as far as organizations and movements, well, I'm not sure that those uh, forces – uh, are looking for a mass campaign, a mass approach. There, you know, when I was in prison, uh, what broke up everything was this attempt by organizations on the outside to find some so-called leader or something on the inside or make him a leader, some prisoner, and uh, and and he would spot their line and all this kind of thing. So yeah. I think I'm not sure that these movements that exist right now uh, would be willing or able to take leadership from prisoners. 
I'm not sure. I, I don't know. You know, we don't. We can't say this is 1970 or something. And the the prison movement that existed at that time was saw itself, and 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 actually, people on outside saw it as being a, a, a autonomous um, um, protest movement. You're bringing a much needed critique right now. <clears throat> well, you know, but but in terms of the movement then. Uh, is it already reached the high stage of, of, of development and struggle? Mm -hmm. That's that's one of the things to bear in mind. So you you can't just get that overnight. Now I think the movement now would be different and, and should be different. Uh, technology or uh, different political perspectives and so forth. And some of that's good. Some of it's bad. Some of it's uh, it, it, you know I don't know how much support on the in, in, on the inside there is with uh, you know for instance uh, Black Lives Matter and all that stuff. You know. Um, to be quite honest, and it's a different kind of organization from most of the groups in the 1970s. Uh, it's much more of a petty bourgeoisie organization, and uh, they're very sectarian in a lot of ways. You know, that's what I found. And um, but nevertheless, we're not talking about me. We're talking about uh, the ability of um, the movement on the inside to see these as legitimate allies, especially in the black community, which is really, really important and has been missing for so long. You know what I'm saying? Other than Attica, that moment with Attica, there has not been uh, a mass base of support in the black community for prisoners. You know, it, it just hasn't existed. Well, I remember and, when we were talking, though, I remember when we were talking, and we were talking about the, the, the it had just been right after the prison strike in 2018, and okay. we were talking about um, uh, the moment in, like, the late 90s where it was, like, 1998, there was critical resistance. There was right. the the anarchist Black Cross like just emerges, kind of uh, reemerges as a federation and a network. And then right. there's um, insight, women of color against violence. So like there's this moment yeah. of um, Jericho, <clears throat> and then you're also even calling in 2002. You're calling for a unite United Prison Front, a whole United movement across. And you actually say verbatim, critical resistance, the North American anarchist black crosses, and all mm -hmm. movements for like queer, disabled, um, uh, 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 all oppressed people, colonized people, yeah. um, uh, uh, a united prison front. And um, so I uh, just want to uh, say that like that moment. Yeah. So it, did it come though? You agreed. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, did it come? Did yeah. it happen? But what, what needs to be addressed is that there are organiz like these are organizations and networks are in place. And mm -hmm. so it's like taking those th uh, existing containers and then doing mm -hmm. something with them, right? Well, well bear this in mind. Um, you know, it, it isn't really about organizations uh, as much as it is about prisoners and their families and the, and the communities they come out of. And uh, what, for instance, what the state has done to to communities of color uh, ever since uh, they resorted to uh, the war on drugs, for instance, and uh, what they, you know, the, and the rise of the of the police, uh, paramilitary police, and all these kinds of things, you know, uh, this was stuff that the original Black Panther Party had educated about and tried to fight about, you know, and they were trying to explain to uh, white radical allies and so forth that, uh, you know, the party, you know, we've talked about it. The party had a uh, perspective on uh, fascism and the state. And, uh, you know, their thing was that uh, they uh, realized that, you know, prisoners could not free themselves. They could not liberate themselves. They had to be part of a broad-based mass movement. And, and that was actually starting to happen to some extent. And that period, especially when George, as George Jackson was laying it out, you know, he was explaining a lot of things. But, uh, you know, yeah, he was explaining a lot of things, but he was a, a, but he was a key figure. And that was, he was a key figure in explaining why we had to have um, this kind of unity. You also talk about Martin Sostry. Yeah, I do. I, well, you know, Martin Sostry is my mentor, so what do you think, you know? But, uh, you know, but Bar Martin was different. See, Martin, um, he came, well, first he's, uh, he came along before George did. And um, his organizing was to lay the basic foundation so that you could even read 
and talk about revolutionary activity, you know what I'm saying, or, or revolutionary politics. He he laid the foundation with that is with his lawsuits and he, he did, did it through the language of fascism, right? He did through the language of anti-fascism, right? He well, yeah, anti-fascist, right? That's the terms he was using. That's the terms he was using, and because um, he was saying like, uh, if you looked at, he said, we're not fighting the police. He said, we're fighting the state. You know, that's some profound shit. I first heard that. I first heard that, and you know, because the left, it was about all these fucking cops and blah 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 blah, and, and the cops are the epitome. You know, they're 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 agents of the state, but they're not the state. You know, and, and that's the kind of shit. That's the kind of shit he always would tell me. It's it's important to understand the distinction between uh, you know police, uh, what they call police power, and it was a it, it was a certain period when the so-called police power thing came to existence in the in the 70s and and 80s you know where they started uh create you know their unions and and allowed them to be autonomous from the mayor or some shit like that or you know on some level and uh then uh, their uh, rise with um uh, paramilitary policing and including the the, the uh SWAT teams and and beyond that you know what i'm saying was what we were talking about how there's differences in this period, and uh, which you, you know, which reduced the strikes, and the period that uh, produced the uh, uh, prison labor union, and the prison labor union was a mass movement in and of itself, and it was you know it was an autonomous mass movement, and um, you know, and they were not in states all over the country, and so, like I said, it took the Supreme Court to rule that this was unconstitutional. And to this day, and now in this day, hardly, it, activists don't even hardly know about it. And the activists have to be charged to always know about these kinds of movements. You know what I'm saying? Because it makes our it makes our work easier in this period, with in our level of understanding of how we can fight and win. And uh, so, this, this this thing was was more than just you know um, you know them having strikes. They were organizing. Uh, local groups and in local areas, they were on the they were looking local. <laughs> they were they had they had outside organizers that had uh, groups on the outside working in communities and stuff. Because I remember one of the things uh, when I was in Atlanta, federal penitentiary, there was this group called Community Aid to Prisoners, and one you know they used to have a, a radio show on college radio in Atlanta, and um, they used to come inside and, 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 you know, work with the prison, uh, the group we had in there and everything, and uh, the so-called legalized group, the, the cultural group. They'd come inside, but their thing was to make sure that prisoners were not, uh, you know, destroyed because they, they'd seen the shit happen in the attic and all that. So their thing was that can't let that happen again. We also got to link uh, the community with prisoners and the plight of prisoners and shit, you know. And, and talk about the, the you know, un unjust and unequal uh, condition of black people that forces us to go to prison anyway or, or allows us to be victims of prisons and all this kind of thing. So we don't, I, I don't know about right now. You you know better about right now about what kind of community-based organizing is going on uh, around prison support. The thing that George Jackson was putting forward is that he, he said that, um, you know, he wanted uh, his his idea was to have a movement where the masses of people in the street, including the communities where the prisoners were from, and 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 you know, radical prisoners and and revolutionary organizations like the Black Panther Party uh, could work together all over the country, and uh, you know, and have a, a dynamic revolutionary perspective uh, on the one hand, but a uh, organizing campaign. We wanted to make the uh, prison movement uh, into a survival movement, you know, like the Black Panther Party organized shit. If you like what you heard there, you can find a recently republished edition from Pluto Press of Lorenza Caboa Irvin's classic, Anarchism and the Black Revolution, plus a bunch of other essays. If you order this from Firestorm Books here in Asheville, you'll get a 10% discount uh, by clicking the link that's in our show notes with a special reference code to us, you'll get a 10% discount and we'll get a kickback too. Otherwise, it's available at any number of renowned booksellers. And a quick note that the interview with Lorenzo was conducted by a member of Truly Press. 
Since 2017, TrueLeap has provided free print political education material for imprisoned people engaging in abolitionist study. They have over 200 titles in their 2022 catalog. They don't keep a mailing list as literature is only available upon request. If you would like a new catalog of their 2022 literature selections, you can visit them online at trueleappress.com or you can write to their new address, True Leap Zine Distro, P.O. Box 6045, Concord, California, 94524. So my guest is Bomani Shakur, uh, also known as Keith Lamar, and he's a man who's currently held on death row in Youngstown, Ohio, as a result of the Lucasville uprising. Bomani was present at the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility during the uprising, and prosecutors have accused him of leading a death squad and that killed a guard and some prisoners. Thank you so much, Mr. Shakur, for taking the time to chat. Yeah, yeah, it's my pleasure. Uh, thanks a lot for having me, yeah. Would you tell us a little bit about yourself and what Ohio was like when you were coming up in the 70s and 80s? Uh, well, I'm 50 years old, so I was born in 1969 in Cleveland, Ohio. It's one of the, I guess, bigger cities of Ohio. I grew up in the, in the 70s, 80s. I don't have too much of a, a recollection of the 70s, per se, in terms of the political situation and whatnot, but... I grew up in this small place called the, called the Village. It was a, a working class neighborhood. Mostly who lived there worked at the steel steel mill, Republic Steel. My grandfather worked there and paid for his house in this little community. And all it was a hundred houses in this community, and everybody you know had their own owned their own home, uh, worked in the mills. And so my early childhood was relatively a peaceful. You know, the most memorable part of my upbringing was that, you know, uh, when I was, you know, between five and 10 years old, when, you know, my family and I, my mother, my brother and sister, I had two brothers and a sister, still young and still lived in the village. Not long after I turned uh, 11 or 12 years old, we moved away from the village. And that's what, that was my uh, interest into, like, mainstream society, basically start going to, you know, public school, a uh, school called Cranwood. And, you know, slowly but surely, because, you know, in the village, it, you know, it, we, were, we were poor, but we didn't really realize we were poor because that wasn't the values or standards of that community. You know, you can go over to anybody's house around dinner time and, you know, and eat. Everybody was family, literally and figuratively. You know, a lot of people, cousins were cousins because of, you know, the close proximity we all was. It was like a close-knit community. So you had a lot of overlap in relations and whatnot. And, um, you know, that was a good thing because, you know, I can play with my friends, my cousins and on, a, on a daily basis. And, you know, there was really no judgment about your uh, attire, your ethnic, social economic status, because everybody was pretty much the same, even though you had some people who had more than others, but it was never really made a, a point. Um something to focus on but when we moved away from uh the village that's when i first became aware that i was poor poor you know uh and the kids my my peers taught me that um you know they you know made fun of my attire a lot my appearance a lot uh you know i was a young kid at the time i eight or nine years old that's what i'm referring to and so you know i was more into playing than i was into you know, worrying about my hair being combed or anything like that. And, and uh, my mother and stepfather, uh, they didn't really, you know, mess with, you know, us uh, boys about our, our parents. So I showed up to school looking like, basically like a, a homeless person, basically. <laughs> and the kids basically let me have it, you know. And so gradually, you know, in response to the ridicule and criticisms I received in elementary school, I developed a, a complex about my appearance and, you know, started, um, you know, uh, trying to, you know, cut grass, deliver papers and whatnot to make money so I can buy the various clothes I needed to stop this ridicule. And, um, you know, so that was really where I kind of learned. And, 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 of course, you know, as I grew older and went further in the, in the, in the school system, this lesson was uh, compounded, but elementary school is basically where I learned that to have what you have is more important than who you who you were. You know, I don't know if the kids, I'm, I'm not sure the kids 
wasn't uh, aware that that was the lesson that they was teaching, that we were teaching each other. But that's essentially what I came away with when I was around 12 or 13. And, you know, as I entered the junior high and then high school, I, you know, went deeper and deeper off into that uh, erroneous idea about having things was more important than, you know, the person I was becoming. And I started star selling drugs when I was around 13, 14 years old, and, you know, to accumulate money to buy these clothes, polo, Ralph Lauren shirts, guest jeans, and all, you know, Michael Jordan shoes, all this material trappings that you see young kids pursuing today. It was no different back then, but, but with the exception that we were literally dirt poor. And so, you know, I became a drug dealer. By the time I was 15, I was living in my own apartment, um, driving a Mercedes Benz, you know, had ran Rolex watches, you know, had a pocket full of money and a whole bunch of friends, quote unquote, um, people who, you know, uh, wouldn't have anything to do with me when I was, you know, had a shabby attire with not but now all of a sudden because, you know, I had, you know, name brand clothing. I was, you know, pretty much one of the most popular individuals at my high school. And I, by the time I turned 17 years old, I had really exhausted um, all my options as a drug dealer, basically. I mean, I was driving around in this foreign automobile and, you know, driving around the same, fill up my gas tank and just drive around all day, basically, like a politician. Hmm. You know, selling drugs, picking up money, shooting dice. And it was the same day over and over again. I got really you know, like exhausted living like that. And um, there at the end, when I was around 18 years old, a group of guys tried to rob me. You know, I had been robbed several times leading up to that, and a group of guys came to rob me instead of, you know, giving, turning over, giving them my jewelry as I did the first case, and I, you know, pulled a gun out and I, you know, uh, engaged in a shootout. You know, I was shot twice myself in the legs and ended up shooting a guy twice in the chest. He died, and, you know, I came to prison. You know, that's how I ended up in prison hmm. in a nutshell. Yeah, you know, so. So fast forward, I guess, uh, four years, right, to, because um, you went in in 89, to yeah. the Lucasville Uprising in April of 1993. Can you talk about what SOCF was like at that point, what Lucasville Penitentiary was like, and, and where you were when stuff popped off and what you were doing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, well, I have to go back a little bit because um, what Lucasville was in 1993 uh, was a result of what it was in 1991. And uh, 1991, a, a white school teacher was uh, murdered by a black inmate. And I emphasize the, the, the race because Lucasville is uh, located in southern Ohio. This call is originating from an Ohio correctional facility and may be recorded and monitored. In the, in, in the, the um, predominantly white uh, community, and the prisoners are, you know, majority black prisoners, you know, from the inner city and whatnot. And these are kind of like, uh, uh, um, I guess you would call hicks, you know, people who haven't really have in, had any, uh, um, you know, day to day interaction with black people, except, you know, through stereotypes or through in the prison. You know, and so, you know, when this guard, when this female guard uh, was murdered, um, you know, people in the surrounding community was calling for the prison to be locked down, calling for more severe, severe, severe measures to be implemented to, you know, quell some of the violence that was going on. Because this, Lucasville was one of the most dangerous prisons in the, in the state of Ohio, uh, probably still is, though I haven't been down there in, in, in a few decades now. Um and so they, uh, um, you know, appointed the new warden, Arthur Tate, and he was brought in as someone who was believed to be a hard liner, that he would, you know, put the hammer down, you know, you know, restore order and, you know, get, you know, get the prisoners in, in line. And so he enacted, you know, a whole lot of kind of draconian standards uh, and practices and whatnot, you know, just forcing guys to sell with people that they didn't necessarily get along with. You didn't really have any say on, 
you know, where you, where you, where you sell or who you sell with, and which was something in prior administrations, you had that because you're living with people. And so, you know, that you created kind of, uh, uh, unstable situation if you are uh, forced to live with somebody you don't get along with, but he didn't, you know, really care about those type of things. And, you know, he wanted to, you know, exert his dominance, you know, uh, you know, flash forward a few years after the teacher was murdered in 1993, and um, he had drew lines on the floor, and we had to stay within the lines. It was like it was almost like a military academy. It's what he was seen to be after at the time. And uh, of course, you know, when you you know have your foot on people's necks who are already oppressed, it only created a kind of powder keg that this building and building and. Um, Right before the uprising, um, they had, um, every year they came around and test prisoners for tuberculosis. And, um, this particular year, for some reason, the Muslims refused to take the test on the grounds that, uh, the test, uh, contained the alcoholic substance called phenol. And apparently that was, you know, against, uh, it was prohibited from ingesting alcohol because of their religious religious uh, beliefs and you know they try to have an audience with the warden and, and the deputy ward to try to suggest alternative ways this test could be administered but take and keep it with his hard line of uh, attitude you know refused them all right and gave them an ultimatum and told them that they either take the test or they was going to they'll be locked up you know put in the hall he told them this i believe on the thursday or friday and let them stew over, you know, their decision over the weekend. And, and the, the Muslims on the Sunday, April 11th, Easter Sunday, decided that they would, you know, take that day as an opportunity to stage what, what they claim would be a, a peaceful protest. On April 11th, this is, you know, according to the record, several Muslims attacked guards, you know, commandeered the keys and, and opened up all the cell doors. And like I said, to, you know, you know, you know, start this, uh, protest. But, you know, once they opened the doors, it was like opening up or striking a match. And, you know, things very quickly got out of hand. You know, when the riot first occurred, I was on the riot because I was on the yard, on the recreation yard. And, um, you know, I was, this was one of the first, it was the first few days of spring in the yard, you know, had been closed the whole winter. And so, you know, I took advantage of the opportunity to go out and get some fresh air. You know, I was out there running and, you know, exercising and, um, you know, a guard came, you know, when it was time to come back in, a guard came running out with blood streaming down his face and whatnot. And so that was the first indication that uh, I or all the people on the yard, you know, uh, uh, had uh, something, you know, going wrong on the inside. And of course, you know, as the time went on, we, we realized that it was a disturbance that was happening and that... Um, you know, the Muslims, you know, they had made it, you know, and known that they had commandeered the prison and that they uh, uh, were staging the protest and asked if anybody who wanted to participate, you know, because, you know, they, were, they weren't the only ones who were being oppressed down there. You know, we all were. You know, we all were living under these kind of adverse conditions and, you know, subjected to these arbitrary rules and regulations and whatnot that Tate was implemented to, you know, for him, you know, to, to his way of thinking would, you know, quell the violence that was going on. It really just, you know, made things worse, you know, as it often does, you know. And so, you know, eventually one of my friends came out and he told me, you know, it gave me, a, you know, a, you know, for what was going on. And, and, you know, from what I initially understood is that guys was going into, you know, other guys' sale, sales, you know, stealing their personal belongings and whatnot. And I didn't have much. But then I also didn't appreciate the magnitude of what was going on. This was in the beginning of the, of the rise. And, and so, you know, I'm thinking that, you know, it would probably be something, a minor skirmish, and, you know, it would be over within, within an hour or so. As you probably know, it lasted 11 days. And so you know, I was way off of my estimation of how serious, severe, you know, things were. And so I went inside, and I happened to be selling an L6 on L side in the sixth pod, uh, and that coincidentally was the pod where the guards had been uh, uh, um, pushed into shower stalls and later where uh, the last uh, snitches were uh, allegedly killed. And, um, you know, I went back into that pod before all these things happened to check on my personal belongings. And, you know, I saw the guards in the, in the, in the um, shower stall and you know of course seeing that 
and and, and um, you know put me on uh, on notice as to the severity of what was going on because whether or not it lasts eleven days or not, you took you have taken took the uh, uh, the step to take God's hostage. This is serious now, and so you know once I you know gradually uh, uh, understood the, the seriousness of it, I, of course you know you know compared it to my my personal belongings and decided to go back on the yard. You know, uh, you know, I was 23 years old at the time. Was you know wasn't necessarily political. Um, I had been doing some reading, like Malcolm X and Franz Fanon and things of that nature. But I, I wasn't necessarily what I would call political, or even necessarily aware of, of that this anything can be done about the oppression that we were living under. You know, that wasn't my. Uh, um, mentality at the time, you know, I was, I didn't really have that, um, kind of awareness and, and not a lot of people did. Um, in fact, uh, the majority of us filed out into the yard and stayed on the yard, uh, until, uh, late in the evening, early morning, and, uh, actually, and, until the highway state patrol. So, you know, you have the, the Muslims commandeered the prison. Then you have the Aryan Brotherhood who joined ranks with the Muslims and another uh, group of individuals called the Black Gangster Disciples. And so now you have three gangs or organizations designing over this uprising. And then you have guys who, uh, like myself, were out on the yard, you know, watching everything unfold. You know, uh, a lot of people are under pressure and since I'm on death row that I was a part of one of those three factions, but I wasn't. And um, I came out onto the yard and was actually uh, picked up from the yard uh, when the Highway State Patrol uh, uh, came out late, early morning, April the 12th, and, you know, uh, you know, ushered us all into the gymnasium. And so I didn't stay inside for the 11 days. Uh, wasn't present when the murders was happening. I was on the yard when they brought bodies out onto the yard and dumped the bodies on the yard. By that time, the Highway State Patrol had um, took up a, a stance around the perimeter uh, fence to make sure no one escaped, but they didn't come in to try to quell, you know, the, the uprising. They, you know, stood there along with us and watched as dead bodies were dumped on the yard. You know, so I, I witnessed that part of the, the uprising, and, and little did I know at the time that I would ultimately be uh, uh, accused in killing this, these individuals who I were who who I was watching, uh, you know, being who, whose bodies I was watching, um, you know, being dumped on the on the yard, you know. So that was one of the, the first disconnects in, you know, how you know oh, I became involved in this whole thing. You know, uh, as I said, they 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 put us in the gym early the next morning. You know, uh, stripped us of all our clothes, and so we were naked, ten of us, and forced us into the cell. And that's really where you know my uh, problem started. You know, I write about it extensively in my book, so it might not do justice describing it over the phone. But while in that cell, uh, an inmate named Dennis Weaver lost his life, and you know I was ultimately accused, you know, uh, forcing individuals to to do that and participate. In it, but in actuality, uh, it was another guy named Shabazz who, you know, really sparked all the confrontations in, 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 that, in that particular situation and, you know, saw a way to, you know, shift the blame onto me after he and the other two guys who helped him uh, murder Dennis Weaver. Because Shabazz and I uh, got into an altercation while we was in the cell. He was kind of like a bully type individual, and he was going around really trying to put his bluff down on each of the individuals in the cell. And when he got to me, I just, you know, hauled off and punched him in his face. You know, something that I talk about in my book. And um, because of that altercation, I think that was what gave him the incentive to really just say, you know, let's just say Keith did it. And that became the reframe. You know, as I later, you know, but it, it wasn't simply somebody pointing a finger at me. Later, when they um, put us under investigation, and um, you know, for nothing, you know, we didn't have anything to do with the ride. We was on the yard, and they put us under investigation, took all our property, and so you know, it was really in that context that I began to become a little political, 
if not knowledgeable about the politics, I don't mean to say that. I just mean uh, to say that um, to you know, you know, to buy into that us against them mentality. And so, you know, we start, um, you know, the group of guys who I was around. This after the ride is already over with. After all the, you know, uh, was said and done, and, you know, the bodies and whatnot, uh, you know, had us in, in, uh, under investigation for, you know, something that we had. This call is originating from an Ohio correctional facility and may be recorded and monitored. You know, and that got all pretty, you know, pr- you know, fairly quickly. And, you know, we started tearing up the, the cell blocks we were in you know, um, throwing our food onto the rain, you know, getting into confrontation with the Highway State Patrol, you know, suggesting, you know, or, or, or advocating that no one talk to the authorities. And, and that's how I became a target, mm. you know, by participating in those demonstrations. And one of the things I, 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 I like people to understand about the uprising is that immediately after the ri- uprising, the state sent that in their investigators and they trampled the crime scene and they collected over 22,000 pieces of evidence, quote unquote, but none of it matched, could be matched to any victim or assailant, no fingerprints, no forensic or anything because they, they rushed in, you know, uh, and trampled the crime scene, basically. They sent everything off to the crime lab to be tested and it came back empty handed. And so what they had to do, the only thing they could do is create a team of informants and select people who they wanted to indict and put on. Quick question, just just for clarification so that I'm, if I'm making mm-hmm. a mistake, I should know. Do you prefer Keith? Do you prefer Bomani? I know like one ties directly to the legal case and like legal support. Uh, what should I be calling you? Yeah, well, well, well. Uh, yeah, we should talk about that, you know, because, you know, that's a question that a lot of people, you know, ask me. Um, and so, um, yeah, uh, Bomani Shakur is a name that I selected, you know, when I was, you know, thrown into the, you know, the midst of all this, you know, madness and needed something to uh, kind of steer me through without, you know, losing hold of myself. So it's not so much a rebellion against my uh, government name. So, so to speak, it's just a, a way to reaffirm my um, my purpose and, and conviction, you know, because mm-hmm. uh, it's easy to lose track of those things uh, when you're in a situation like this and that stretches over, you know, such a you know great length of time and and, and, and difficulties, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially when you've got a number imposed on you, like that's attached to your name, and it seems really powerful to be able to pick something that is like so symbolically important to you and representative of, right, of your struggle. Right. Yeah, right. But a number, along with you know, just the structure of this place, is a reduction, right, of of, of your humanity to just reduce you to an animal. And so, you know, um, uh, um, choosing the name Bomani, it, my, the full name is Bomani Hindu Shakur. Bomani is Mani soldier. Hundu is prepared for war. And Shakur is uh, the thankful. And so uh, those attributes, are, you know, so when somebody say, hey, Bomani, it's just a reminder just that you have, that you are a Mani, you know, soldier and that, you know, uh, whatever difficulties that I might be experiencing at that time, it's just a reminder that you can rise above those things, whatever it may be. And Hundu, be, be prepared. It's just to, you know, stay focused and to, uh, uh, you know, study, you know, just try to be as prepared as you possibly can, you know. And thankful, uh, Shakur, it's just, you know, no matter how difficult or dark, you know, the present moment might be, you know, be thankful for the fact that you are alive, that you are, you know, healthy, that you, you know, have a lot of good people in your life and that, you know, though the circumstances are, you know, out of my control to a certain degree, that, uh, you know, you know, be thankful that I still have my faculties, that I can still stand up and fight for myself. So, you know, I'm thankful for all the, uh, the good things that are in my life that, you know, me staying the course uh, uh, has produced in my life. And so, you know, my name is not just, you know, words, it's, you know, like the number, you know, you know, you know like my, you know, prison number, mm-hmm. you know, it's just, you know, it resonate meaning for me. You know, when somebody called me for money, they're just really calling me to remember who I am. Mm. And, you know, so um, that was, the, you know, the, it's my freedom name, you know, a uh, uh, way for me to, uh, you know, hold on to my freedom, you know, uh, in the midst of all this, uh, it's, because, you know, it's, it's, it's overwhelming being in a situation like this. 
and you just and then a lot of times you feel you know you know especially in the beginning you you, you know i felt like i was in this by myself not so much now you know i'm 50 years old and i've come a long way in terms of my development and whatnot and so i've been lucky enough you know to garner uh, a lot of support um but in the beginning when i was um not who I am today. Uh, it was, you know, kind of a whole lot more difficult to uh, uh, navigate, you know, things, you know. And so, um, you know, the name started with that. You know, that was the first realization that I needed to, you know, uh, uh, inject some purpose into my life and not just drift aimlessly through my days. That I need to be about, you know, the business of uh, uh, freeing myself and representing myself. And so, you know, uh, the name along with. A, you know, writing a book and all the other things have just been, you know, uh, me putting one foot in front of the other and trying to, you know, find my way forward, you know, basically. Hmm. Yeah. So getting back to the, the, the days at 1993, you had said that you hadn't, mm-hmm. before the you'd done some reading, you hadn't been like what you would consider to be like very much engaged in politics. You'd read some Fanon and yeah. some, some Malcolm X. Mm-hmm. Um, I know for a lot of people, like looking back and studying, the uprising between mm-hmm. the self advocacy of the Muslims, you know, rebelling against this like obvious insult to their, you know, to their strictures of their faith, and mm-hmm. also the the fact that those three groups, in particular the the Muslims and the Black Gangster Disciples, as they were called at the time, and the Aryan Brotherhood, could come together and, you know, obviously imperfect, but decrease the amount of killing and theft and harm that was occurring within the facility, possibly. And a lot of people took from it this message of like a convict race, of, of a common shared mm-hmm. oppression um, by the system. It seems like the story of, of what happened next and what happened in the courts was, was in a lot of ways a continuation of that same call the bang for blood by the neighboring communities. Like this is happening at the same time as the Waco invasion is happening in Texas. And so that's one reason that a lot of people won't have heard about the Lucasville uprising. That's, that's where all the cameras are pointed, but Uh I'd I'd love to hear what you have to say about uh, following the, the initial investigation where everything was trampled, how the trial was conducted and why do you think it was so easy for these people maybe who participated in the violence to, to finger you and state prosecutor Mark Peep Meyer and others to, to target you throughout the case for blame? Well, I think they, they you know, mainly I, I believe they were uh, primarily interested in uh, convicting someone for the guards murder, obviously, because I'm so the 11 other people who were killed, his life was the only life that really had any real value, right? You know, they didn't give a damn about the prisoners who were, who were killed. As I said, you know, they stood there and watched along with everyone else as those bodies were dumped on the yard. I could have been one of those bodies. You know, and, and you no, know, I wasn't political, but, you know, I, I was, you know, uh, extremely upset at the way that uh, after the riot as in the way that we were being treated. You know, and, you know, I was vocal in my, you know, anger of uh, that treatment, you know, um, and, you know, I was doing 15 years to life uh, with the possibility of parole at the time. And so when they uh, finally singled, singled in on me, focused in on me, they didn't, they, they didn't do so with the, with the belief that I would go forward and demand a trial. You know, they came to me, and look, Keith, you know, they called me by my first name as if we was, you know, old pals or whatever. And they said, look, you know, and they spelled it out for me, basically, you know, did the math for me. You know, it's a real basic math. You know, uh, if you go forward, you know, we're going to put you on death row. If you take this deal, you have a possibility to go home in your early 50s. You know, but, you know, and I said, you know, but I didn't do what y'all claiming I did. You know, I didn't have anything to do with it. I came out on the yard. Hey, listen, we're not here to talk about that, you know, about what you did or what you didn't do. That obviously is a moot issue at this point. We're trying to figure out whether or not you want to accept this deal. And it's a good deal. And it was a good deal. You know, 90% of the people who are in prison are here because they've taken the deal. They've taken a lesser sentence than the one that they can potentially get, you know, if they go, uh, if they demand a jury trial, you know. 
when I had taken a lot of deals up, up until that point in my life, you know, I dropped out of school. I became a drug dealer as I, you know, recounted and, and, you know, I had, you know, really, really just turned my back on my potential. And I didn't realize it until I came to prison. Until I really had the type of opportunity to slow down and see what I had done with my life. You know, because, you know, when I was 14, going, you know, all the way through 19, it was just a blur, really. You know, every day was, you know, a party, basically. I'm getting high, I'm selling drugs, I'm shooting dice, I'm, I'm spending money, and, you know, I'm living w what I thought or believed at the time was a good life. You know, but I had to end, as I, as I mentioned, I had came to the realization that, you know, something was amiss. And uh, right before I caught the murder case, I had disavowed all, you know, the drug dealing and getting high and all that, and I got baptized. It's a funny thing, you know, I, I said, well, man, I'm going to turn my life over to God. And it's the second time I had did that in my life. I did it once when I was 13, when I felt like my life was coming a, apart, when I was losing control of the direction of my life. And I did it again when I was 18, six months before I uh, ultimately took somebody's life and came to prison. So it was always a part in me that wanted to, you know, find my way back to myself, to the self I was before I got caught up in, you know, uh, the mainstream, uh, I guess you could say, before I got caught up in all the material trappings that go along with, you know, this society, you know. And so when I came to prison and, and when I was off the deal, I was just tired, man. I was just, I was just sick of just taking the easy way out in my life, you know. And so I, I refused. I said, you know, I'm not going to do that, man. I'm, I'm done taking deals. I'm done, you know, going along, you know, you know, because, you know, uh, and, and not only are you taking deals to get home to, you know, you know, you know, possibly I could have got on the stand and lied on somebody else, even though, you know, you know, a lot of guys opt to, you know, take that route. You know, that just wasn't an option for me either. You know, so the only option, you know, that I had, because, you know, they made it, you know, plain that somebody's going to death row. In fact, before we was even, you know, put on trial, a lot of us was moved to the bottom range of the death row pod so we can get accustomed to the idea. And it was it was crazy. So I had a kind of foreshadowing, a kind of glimpse of what death row would be like because I was there before I even went to trial. You know, and... and, and um. I still made the, the decision to go forward. You know, I had never, you know, uh, uh, had a trial. And as I said, not a lot of people have. And so, you know, I didn't really know what to expect, you know, but, you know, they offered me a deal. You know, I refused it. I demanded the trial. And, you know, I, I got to see firsthand really what justice, is, you know, is about in this country, man. You know, a lot of people, you know, look at these, uh, uh, you know, crime dramas on television and, and think from that they have a, a, a sense of what the American justice system is about. But that's TV shit. You know, in, in, in real life, the first thing they do, if you, especially if you're black, you know, the, the first thing they do is try to uh, 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 strike all the black jurors from the jury pool and so they can have an all-white jury. And, you know, that's their secret weapon. You know, you know, to uh, assemble an all white jury. That's the first thing. And they, you know, and, and they go through this process called board deer where you, 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 where you're allowed to question people, try to figure out what their political leanings are and whatnot. And it was just amazing. You know, uh, I was 23, 24 years old at the time. And so wasn't really, really, um, adapting, uh, uh, interpreting all these different, you know, uh, uh, complicated words and processes and whatnot, and, you know, but I was, you know, I grew up in the streets, you know, I grew up with people, you know, say one thing and do another, and I grew up around con men, you know, and, and I saw the jury that they was trying to finagle their way onto the jury so they can, you know, have the uh, experience, I guess, to tell their children one day, you know, I put a black man on death row. You know, you know, you know, if you, you know, uh, uh, know anything about history and I've seen history books about the lynching that, you know, went on in this country, you see, you know, most of those lynchings were attended by crowds of white people standing there with sandwiches and, you know, like it was some kind of, uh, 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 uh you know, picnic, you know, some kind of extravaganza or something, you know. And so, you know, you know, something to tell your, 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 your children about that, you know, uh, you know, you know, I did this, you know. And so, you know, I saw that whole thing and then I saw the, you know, the, the judge colluding with the prosecutor to deprive me of a fair trial, withholding evidence, coaching witnesses, you know, all these things. You have one minute remaining.
and, and um, you know, I was pretty much learning uh, by trial and error. I was just looking and learning a little bit too slow, but I was learning, though. Hmm. So the stuff that I'm, you know, saying and, and sharing, you know, I might not be able to benefit from the knowledge because it's after the fact. It's hindsight is what I'm talking about. But I'm just telling people, as somebody who has seen it with my own eyes, what the system is really about. You know, I'm one of the few who has picked around the corner and have developed a vocabulary to talk about these things, to articulate, you know, uh, uh, what, what, what the reality of this, this, this system is. You know, and so that's basically what, I, uh, what my primary objective is, just to tell people that this system is a sham. It really is. You know, from, 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 from Dean to... As they say, it's, it's just one big mockery, man. It's, it's just, you know, like from... Pre- the Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero network of anarchist podcasts. And here's a jingle from another member of CZN. Hello, and welcome to the Milwaukee Lit Supply podcast. The Milwaukee Lit Supply is a project distributing radical literature in the community and across the fences into Wisconsin prisons. The Lit Supply is a member of the Channel Zero network of anarchist podcasts. On this podcast, we talk about one of the radical zines from the Lit Supply catalog each month. It is June. It is July. It is August. And this month, we are going to be discussing colonization and decolonization. A world without police. Blood in My Eye by George Jackson. This author does a really good job at breaking it down and having like really uh, approachable. um... The best revolutionaries you're going to find are in prison. You got to you got to change the the very structure and the framework that you're working in. I just thought that was like a dope realization. (laughs) If you would like to learn more about our project, get involved or come on our podcast, go to our website at mkelitsupply.com. Thank you for using GTL. So, Bamani, I, I wondered if you could talk a bit about you had a you had a Brady hearing uh, a few years back uh, to attempt yeah. to to attempt to get a new trial, as, as far as I'm aware, because there were so many instances oh, right. yeah. where the prosecutors had had denied potentially exculpatory evidence from the defense. Mm -hmm. And we all know that like public defense in this country anyway is perpetually like underfunded when you get a good defender who actually wants to do their job. We've had Nikki Schwartz on, on the show before, which we're very lucky for. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about some of that evidence that you're aware of that was um, withheld from your ability to defend yourself and, and what that Brady hearing was like too. Yeah, well, you know, you know, when you um, um, go to trial, you, 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 one of the first things your attorneys, defense attorneys, do is file a motion for discovery because, you know, discovery is the mechanism that you uh, through which you de- you defend yourself. You you want to know um, who said what, to when, how many times did they say it, you know? And uh, when we requested this discovery, the statements, of witnesses who testified on me, and it's not just people who said they saw me kill somebody, there's exculpatory evidence of people who said they saw somebody else kill the same people for whom I was charged with. And so what they did, and it was the first time I haven't heard one attorney say that they have ever seen anything like this. What they did, instead of turning over the statements, they divided the names of the individual who made these exculpatory statements in one column and put a, a summary of their statements in another column, mixed them up. Didn't tell us who said what, or, you know, you know, what was going on. I talk about this in my book. And they said, well, uh, this is the best we can do. So it, was, it wasn't straightforward from the, from the beginning. Not only that, I found out afterwards that it was a guy, I was accused of being the leader of the death squad. Uh, and you remember I said it was three groups who were, you know, it was widely known that they were uh, uh, um, in charge of the riot, Aaron Brotherhood, the Muslims, and the Black Gangs Disciples. Well, the leaders from the Black Gangs Disciples uh, were basically made up the, the, the star witnesses for the state after everything was all over said and done, particularly a guy named Lavelle and Stacy Gordon. And Stacy Gordon, from what I've been able to piece together since the riot, he may have been the leader of the death squad based on some of the people who actually saw what was going on. But, um, 
you know, uh, um, that didn't come out until after the fact. Because one of the other things that the state did, when I asked for my discovery, they gave my discovery to Jason Robb, gave Jason Robb discovery to me, gave my, you know, and so on and so forth, switched up, you know, they put everything, mixed everything up, you know. And so we didn't find out until we got on death row proper that, you know, what the, what the, what the state strategy had been. And uh, I found out that a guy named Aaron Jefferson had came forward and admitted to killing somebody for whom I was sentenced to death, a guy named Daryl DePina. And, 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 you know, for people who, who you know, read that statement, you know, the, the, the interviewer, you know, uh, has some doubts about his uh, uh, recollection of the, uh, the death of the guard because he admitted to assaulting the guard, the landing him, who was ultimately killed in the riot. And uh, he admitted to assaulting a guy named Emmanuel Newell. And during that uh, interrogation, the interviewer called into question the, his recollection of these incidents, but not the one pertaining to uh, Bill DePino, uh, which is the guy he admitted to killing. You know, but they had already had me on the hook for that. And so they, 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 they just blew over it, just, you know, buried that statement. And not only that, you know, some of the key witnesses for the state it wasn't until their fourth or fifth statements that they all agreed that Keith Lamar was the leader of the death squad. You know, in their first generation, the first statements, the first copy of the statements, they were pointing their finger at someone else or, 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 or didn't know who, you know, did what. But what happened in there is, remember when we go back to what I was saying, that um, of the 22,000 pieces of evidence that, they, that was collected, none of it, all of it was con contaminated. So they didn't have an objective case. So what they did, the only thing they could have done is put together this team. They moved them to this hospital called Oakwood here in Ohio, and they went over script. They had an open door policy and all this documented after the fact. You know, they, they, they had an open door policy in this prison with, you know, these informers going back and forth, sharing stories, collaborating, you know, on, on, these, on this narrative. And they just rolled it out, man. You know, and we didn't realize, because that, that's the only thing they could do. And, and not only that, they, they put together this, this snitch academy is what it was later uh, came to be known as. But they, 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 they prevented me from putting forth a proper defense. That was part of their strategy as well. Well, flash forward to 2007, I, I, I won an evidentiary hearing. The, courts, the federal courts you know, called uh, me back to, uh, um, to court and allowed us to call the prosecutor, Prosecutor Pete Meyer, who you mentioned earlier. And we put him on the stand. He admitted on the stand that they used what was later to defined as a narrow standard with regard to Brady. You know, his standard was, okay, it's only exculpatory if we call somebody forward and, and, and he, at the end of his statement, say, by the way, Keith Lamar was not there. Unless he says that. So just to, you know, let let you understand what I mean by that. If a guy came forward and claimed to have saw somebody do the very thing that I was accused of, and and and, and explain it in graphic detail, if this person before he get up and leave that interview, if he didn't say, "Oh, by the way, Keith Lamar was not there," that statement was not turned over to my defense. And all the judges, you know, and, and during this evidentiary hearing, um. Hassan's attorney, Jason Rob's attorney, uh, James Ware attorney, they were present when this was going on, when the uh, prosecutor Pete Meyer made these admissions, and they jumped right on it, and they filed that, you know, necessary briefs, and then they got their cases put on hold, and some of the cases are still on hold, you know, barring, and, and the judges in, in their respective cases said that, listen, this is a narrow standard that the prosecutor Pete Meyer used. And we're going to allow y'all to go back to comb the file yourselves. And if y'all finding something that's exculpatory, that y'all deem exculpatory, bring it back to me and I'll make that determination. My attorneys, for some unfounsible reason, didn't file those motions. I talk about this also in my book, you know, at length. And, um, you know, this is one of the main contentions around which we, we, we fell out. You know, because, you know, after, you know, they promised that they would file the motions to put my case on hold because, you know, uh, mind you, it was at my evidentiary hearing that these admissions were made. And so if anybody should benefit from this new knowledge, it should been should have been me. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm glad that other guys were able to benefit from it. But I'm just talking about the, 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 the shabby representation that I had. Mm -hmm. You know, and see, that's the thing that a lot of people don't understand about the criminal justice system. You know, if you're poor... Uh, uh, 
you really don't have a say in your representation. You know, you know, you know, the uh, attorneys expect you to sit there and shut your mouth. You know, and a lot of times, you know, as it is in my case, you know, I was so young, I didn't really know anything about the criminal justice system. And, you know, I've learned a, a great deal since my conviction, but, you know, you can't put the uh, wine back in the bottle. So, as they say, you know, uh, you know, uh, I'm grasping at straws, basically, as you, as you, as you might know, I received an execution date, uh, last year you know, for the 16th of November, 2023. And one of the things, the Ohio Supreme Court issued that execution date. And in 2014, the Ohio Supreme Court, the same body of judges convened a task force to study the death penalty here in Ohio and uh, charged them to come up with recommendations to make the carrying out the capital punishment more equitable here in, in, in this state. And one of the recommendations that the task force, and the task force was made up of lawyers, academics, uh, uh, ex-judges and whatnot, so credential people, you know, paid for by, through taxpayer funding. You know, one of the recommendations that they came up with that they gave to the Supreme Court here, Ohio Supreme Court, is that no one, can be sentenced to death based solely on the uncorroborated testimony of jailhouse informants. So not only can you not put them on death row, but you cannot, you, you definitely can't kill them, you know, based on this uncorroborated testimony. And as I said at the outset, when they came into the prison after the uprising, they trampled the crime scene. So there's no forensic evidence. It never was. And that's the, you know, the crooks of, of where of my case as, as it stands right now. Is trying to get the, the, the higher Supreme Court, the people who gave me an execution date, to follow the recommendation of the task force that they convened. Hmm. You know, and that's what I'm, uh, I'm hopefully going to build my movement around. Just that fact alone. I'm not even supposed to be on death row, you know, for the simple fact that I'm innocent first and foremost. But secondly, you know, legally, they wasn't supposed to be able to put me on death row because they didn't have any co uh, corroborating evidence. All they had was jailhouse uh, uh, informants who they paid to say what they said, and I can prove that. And so those informants were paid how? Were they given, like, breaks on their sentences? or you know, Paid in early paroles, paid in cushy uh, prison assignments. They was moved from maximum security to minimum security. The majority of them went home early. Uh, a lot of them had blood on their hands, so they were paid in, in, in reduced sentences. You know, and uh, Lavelle, who was the ringleader, you know, and possibly, from what I understand, had something, had a hand in killing the guard, is on the street now. You know, so paid in, 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 in real, you know, uh, uh, in, in a real way, in a real sense, you know. Yeah. How are you requesting for people on the outside to help with that push to, to get the Ohio Supreme Court, I guess, to reassess your conviction? Well, it, you know, it's... it's by doing the things that we're doing now, you know, the whole point of me doing this, you know, this interview is to make people aware of, of, of my situation. You know, that's the whole point of writing the book. You know, because people have to believe in, in order for a movement to sustain itself, people have to believe in what they're involved in. So what I'm, you know, you know basically uh, I'm trying to do is uh, uh, retry my case in the court of public opinion mm -hmm. and just get the people to learn the particulars of my case, and not just the particulars of my case, the, the particulars of the MO or the system, how the system operates. Mm -hmm. yeah, because this is a playbook that I'm actually talking about. I mean, it seems incredible, you know, for me to say, hey, listen, I was framed and this is how. But if you go back to the Attica riot, if you go back to, you know, they just got this movie come out, Just Mercy, you know, uh, with Brian Stevenson. You know, uh, uh, in the way that they railroaded this innocent man onto death row. It's the same thing happened in my case. So it's a playbook that I'm talking about. An old playbook that stretches back to slavery after it became, you know, after, it, you know, uh, extrajudicial uh, murders, lynchings were, you know, uh, frowned upon in society. So, you know, it's legal lynching now. And it's a way that they go about doing that. You know, and, and I'm just trying to you know, get people to wake up to the realities of uh, how the system actually operates and, and, and wake up to the reality that, you know, uh, you know, we like to believe that we have overcome, you know, as a society, as a people, 
that we have came up, come a long way in terms of race relations in this country. But, you know, fundamentally, especially when you're talking about the, the justice system, you know, fundamentally, it's all this, it's, nothing has changed, basically. Mm-hmm. Nothing has changed. So I don't like to talk about my story as it's something new, that it's, this is something that's only happening to Keith Lamar, to Bomani Shakur. You know, this is a system that I'm, that I'm talking about. I mean, poor people who are, you know, hearing this message and wondering why you should, you know, give a damn uh, about me and what happens to my life. You should understand that this can happen to somebody that you love, somebody that you care about. And when it's your turn, they don't, you know, as they say in Judge Mercy, they don't need any evidence or fingerprints or anything. And so, you know, we have to, you know, come together to, you know, uh, make sure that justice is a two-way street. You know, make sure that, you know, the people who are, you know, uh, exacting these harsh penalties, that they are held accountable when they are wrong and that they are, you know, brought to bear or, 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 brown, or, or held to some kind of, you know, accountability when, you know, when it's discovered that they are wrong. Because it, it, it could be said that, you know, I didn't know, you know, you know, at the time. I don't see how in my instance um, they couldn't have known, right, you know, but what they, what they assumed. And they had reason to believe that I was, you know, plead guilty because that's what people do. If you're poor, if you're black, if you, you know, in a, you know, dealing with a racist uh, system, you know, it's not matter. It's not a, a, a matter of whether or not I'm innocent or not, but you know, but you know, what kind of deal I can get. You know, what I mean, that's what it comes down to, basically. And so, you know, you know, and I knew that. I understood that. You know, I'm not saying that I was completely naive. You know, I had copped out before, but in that instance, I was actually guilty. You know, and, and I didn't think I was getting away with anything. You know, I like I said, I had just got baptized six months before I caught the murder case. You know, so I had an inkling that you know I was on the on the wrong path. You know, and so me pleading guilty was another way to re, you know reclaim myself to find my way back to myself. I wasn't really trying to find an easy way out. Hmm. You know, but I pled guilty because I was guilty. And here these people come around and ask me to plead guilty to five murders. As if we're talking about, you know, uh, 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 you know, five dollars or five Big Macs, you know, five hamburgers, you know, because that's essentially what, you know, it, you know, if you're poor and you're black in this country, that's essentially what your life amounts to. Your life isn't worth really shit. The only value that your life has is the value that you place on it. And so that go back to, you know, me selecting the name Bomani, you know, that's a way for me to uh, uh, inject value into my life, into, you know, you know, you know my path, you know, and, you know, I intend to pursue it, you know, to the bitter end as need be, you know, if people, you know, hear my story and it resonates with them and they feel that, you know, they should support me that could, because they understand that they too are caught up in the same, you know, system that, you know, it, with those people, I, I'm in solidarity. You know, you know, I, you know, I don't necessarily believe that, you know, this, 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 you know, I don't believe in fairy tales. I don't, you know, necessarily believe that, you know, this, this, this situation, you know, will end happily ever after. You know, more likely than not, I would end up doing the rest of my life in prison or, you know, strapped down to a gurney somewhere. So, I, you know, I've already, you know, made, come to terms with those realities. So that's not really what's guiding me now, fear of those outcomes. Uh, like as you said, this isn't just about you, but it, it is about you, and and you've made a lot of efforts while on the inside to while building your case and trying to seek justice and reprieve from this injustice. Uh, you've also been That's working right. very hard writing the book, uh, revising it. Uh, you participated in a number of different interviews with folks on the outside, academics and journalists, and you've helped to set up and run Native Sons as a program. Can you talk a bit about how you've been giving back to the world while Ohio has kept you locked in a cage? That, 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 that again, goes back to me trying to uh, redeem myself. You know, when you go into prison, you know, the ideal, or the theory at least, is that, you know, you are a member of society who have ran afoul of the standards and laws of the community, and so you are sent to prison to be prepared to that community, right? But, you know, we all know that that's not the case, and that really uh, the criminal justice system, you know, it's, it's a business. Mm-hmm. It's an $80 billion uh, a, dollar a year business, man. So we're talking a lot, a lot of money is involved in, you know, putting people in these sales. And you can say whatever you want to say, but they created the justification to, you know, lock people up in these cages. 
And I came to that understanding quite late in my life, but I came to it, though. And so, you know, one of the things you talk about the uh, nonprofit, uh, you know, getting books into younger people, you know, you know, you know, part of, you know, uh, um, my understanding about my life, is, you know, my life is just not, you know, from, you know, for myself. You know, I, I come from a community, you know, from a people, you know, and this community that I come from uh, are, are, are oppressed. You know, it's, it's just some young person right now sitting at home or walking down the street right now who would be where I'm at because that's how the system works, right? And, and, and it's, so it's my, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, job to try to get some kind of information into this young person's hand to, you know, try to help him interrupt, you know, this, 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 this plan, you know, that is, you know, set up for him because it's not anything personal. And that's really the most horrifying thing about, you know, living this, this life. I mean, they don't really give a damn about Keith Lamar. Keith Lamar is nobody. Another nigga we're going to kill. They've been killing niggas in, in America for 400 years, and everybody know that. You know, I mean, let's 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 talk real about it. But that's how they feel, not how I feel. And so I have to, you know, behave in a way that reflects my beliefs and feelings. And so, you know, what I do is is, is try to, you know, uh, you know, get books in these people, and because books are, are coming into a, a great awareness of who I am and, and what life is about, it's what has allowed me to, you know, uh, 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 survive what I've been through. You know, and, you know, you know, you know, you shouldn't have to learn about life. You shouldn't have to come to prison to learn about life, to learn about who you are, to be educated. And I was mentioning to someone the other day about the root word of education is to educe, to bring forth that which is already there. That's not being done in the public school system. You go through all those years of education and end up at the end of all of that learning, quote unquote, and don't have a clue about who you are. And that's on purpose. Because your life is not your life, you know, uh, as far as these people are concerned. As far as they're concerned, your life is just a piece of firewood. That they're going to throw on the fire when the fire... This call is originating from an Ohio correctional facility and may be recorded and monitored. That's all it is. And it's not just black people. It's poor people in general. No. People don't give a damn about our lives. You know, that includes the guards that work here. You know, what I was telling a um, uh, uh, guy yesterday about, you know, when I first, when I was young, and, you know, I, I used to hate the police, man, the guards. You know, because it was obvious to me that they was profiting from my pain, off my pain. You know, not 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 so different than me standing on the corner profiting off the pain of, of these drug addicts and whatnot. See, that's how I saw it. And I still see it that way. But I realized that they just poor people trying to provide for their family. It's despicable, though. But that's what capitalism is about. It's about degradation. It's about bringing people down to their lowest level so, you know, they don't have any qualms about exploiting, you know, their neighbor. That's what it's all about. But, you know, you as an individual, you know, you might not be able to change the world, but you can change yourself. You know, that's, some of the, that's what I'm trying to, you know, the knowledge I'm trying to get into young people to understand that, you know, this thing is big. Yes, it is. The universe is, is vast, man. It's big, you know. And you might not be able to change races. You might not, you know, because, you know, people who are, you know, far, you know, more intelligent than I am have tried. You know, and yet here we are in the, in the 21st century and we're still having the same conversation. So I'm not under the illusion that, you know, I'm going to be the same thing to change the system. But I have changed myself, though. And no matter what these people say, no matter what they ultimately do, they can't change that fact. That's what I'm trying to, you know, get other young people to understand, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kind of on that same general topic about the you know, the degradation and the, the, the view that, that poor people are replaceable, whether they be the people that are in the cages or the people that are walking around and get to go home at night. That's right. Um, across the U.S., governments at various levels have shown uh, themselves totally incapable of effectively dealing with the spread of coronavirus uh, throughout the population, particularly hitting populations of color for a lot of reasons. Um, yeah, right. 
And prisons are most certainly an area that we see folks really denied the means of sanitation, food, exercise, fresh air, and protective gear. How have you experienced the pandemic at OSP Youngstown? Uh, Do many guards and prisoners seem stricken with COVID-19, and are there any safety precautions being offered? I'm in I'm in solitary confinement. I'm I was already quarantined. I've been quarantined for uh, 27 years now. You know I already had a mask. You know because you know if they spray mace in here, it, we all connected to the same ventilation system. So if a guy is sprayed down with mace in another pod, you know ultimately that mace will find its way to me. So we already had masks. We were already you know prepared for coronavirus. Basically, nothing much has changed uh, where I am. Uh, if from my understanding, one guard tested positive and, um, pretty much, uh, uh, we've been, you know, wearing masks openly around here now. Uh, um, the administration, the prison passed out masks to, uh, to each of uh, the prisoners here. But, you know, we're in a closed environment. That's what solitary confinement is. They, you know, uh, uh, um, you don't have any contact with the outside world, basically. And so uh, if there's any advantage to being in this type of situation, you know, uh, you very seldom have ever get sick in these places. And I'm not saying uh, uh, that we are not concerned. We definitely, definitely are concerned about catching the virus because it's not so much catching this, it's about what happens to you if you do. Because the health care in these places, as you might imagine, you know, it's, it's leave a lot to, you know, be desired, man, because, you know, they, 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 the money has been reallocated to build more prison, the money that they have to take care of prisoners when they get sick or whatever, you know, that money has been put in other places. You know, and so, like for instance, uh, at the prison here in Marion, Ohio, my understanding is that they have over 1,900 prisoners who have tested positive for the coronavirus. Damn near 80% of that particular prison. And from what I understand, and it's been hard to get the exact numbers, but from what, from what I understand, you know, six or uh, to ten people have died, prisoners, and and some staff. You know, and it's my understanding. I don't know whether or not this is true or not, but I've been given to understand that they have shipped other guards into Marion because you know they are running uh, low on workers. And so there again is an example of you know just poor people just being thrown in, in the fire, man. You know, and, and, you know, a lot of these guards obviously don't live with the awareness that, you know, they share something in common with the people they are guarding because that, you know, that's, that's, that, that, that comes down to narrative, right? You know, because, you know, I used to tell myself a story when I was standing on the corner selling drugs to my, you know, to my community. You know, and that's how you do, that's how you do those things and, 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 and you know, salve your conscience. You, you tell these stories. You, it's lies, basically. You know, but yeah, these are just poor people. So, you know, as I said, you know, I used to hate these people, but, you know, you know, the opposite of uh, hate is not hate. The opposite of hate is understanding. And so, you know, I just try to keep my, uh, uh, my, uh, mind focused on that, on trying to understand what I'm caught up in and then trying to understand, you know, where I end and where this other shit begins and so I can protect myself. You know, um, that's what each of us are, are trying to do inside these places. You know, uh, I wear a mask, I, I wash my hands, and, you know, to the point now where my hands are, are basically raw. Mm. You know, and, um, you know, I'm trying not to catch it. You know, I'm trying to stay alive. You know, you know, the same thing I'm doing, you know, by talking to you. This is all about, you know, just trying to stay alive because I have a right to be here. Yeah. You know, my life means something to me. You know, and, you know, and in as much as my life is not for these people to take, I tend to fight them. You know, and, you know, if that's by wearing a mask or writing an essay or whatever form that, you know, that take, I tend to fight them to the bitter end, man. And that's on everything. So what do you plan on doing when you get out? I, I, I don't think I think a lot about, about getting out. You know, I'm doing, you know, I'm living my life right now. Mm-hmm. You know, trying to be true to who I am right now. And I imagine, or at least I hope, that I could be continue, you know, be able to continue with myself, you know, uh, should, you know, I find myself on the other side of this. Cause I, I don't, I don't, I don't particularly like to look at life as in and out, particularly, particularly when it pertains to all the things we've been talking about. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, you know, I'm not the only one doing time here. We're all doing time. You know, in the, in the sense that we are all, you know, kind of trapped in these dichotomies, like white, poor, whatever, gay, straight, whatever. You know, those are prisons, basically. 
you know, I, you know, when I first was thrown into this place, that they only allowed us to have four books. And I, you know, you know, that's been one of my, you know, major uh, uh, support networks uh, in prison. You know, having a, a informative library. You know, uh, I tell people all the time that, you know, uh, you know, my library is like my family, my extended family. You know, you know, Richard Wright, James Baldwin, particularly James Baldwin. So when they told us we can only have four books, you know, I was really, you know. In the pickle because you know I can't you know you know you know it's like you know choosing between your 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 brothers and your father like you got to get rid of them so you know I memorized a lot of books a lot of you know main paragraphs and whatnot and James Baldwin in particular you know I his book fire next time I committed mm. damn near that whole book to memory you know and, and 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 you know his book more than any other books really gave me the sense that you know we are all in the same boat. You know, we here on planet Earth. And just because these people who are in power say that, oh, you're in prison, and so you must behave in, a, in this particular way because you are in prison, you know, that's all about being in prison. You know, that's all about being uh, 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 what somebody else, you know, uh, uh, says you, you know, tell you you have to be. You know, a prisoner, you know, an inmate. You know, I'm a human being. And so, you know, I would like to like to think that, you know, if I'm somehow blessed with the opportunity to walk through those gates, that I will continue to be a human being. You know, but one of the things that uh, James Baldwin and I wanted to uh, uh, share this with with your listeners, you know, uh, you know, first get that book fired next time. It's an awesome book. You know, uh, it was written, you know, um, probably 40, 30, 40 years ago, but a lot of what he talked about in that book, especially if you're black, especially if you are a young black person in this country, a lot of it is still pertinent today. But one of the things he said it was pertaining to all of us, he said, you know, life is tragic simply because the earth turns and because the sun rises and sets. And one day for each of us, you know, it will go down for the last, last time. So that's the reason why life is tragic. That no matter what we do, that tomorrow, you know, uh, uh, will be Thursday, you know, and then the day after that will be Friday. We can't stop it. And that the sun, you know, inexorably in rises and sets. And one day for each of us, I mean, you know, over, uh, uh, you know, 30, 40,000 people have died of the coronavirus. You know, those people were not in prison. They were out there on the outside. You know, so we all, you know, kind of on death row. You know, you know, because that's what this being on this planet is about. And one of the other things that James Baldwin said, he said that uh, uh, perhaps the whole root of our trouble, the human trouble, is that we will sacrifice all the beauty in our lives. We'll imprison ourselves in, in, in taboos and, and, and totems and churches and steeples and mass and races and armies in order to deny the fact of death, which is the only fact we have. So here I am on death row, and we having this conversation that you are in a different situation than I am, and that I think is a misunderstanding. That your life is just as you, your life is in just as a serious situation as mine is, hmm. if you're looking at it properly. You only have a limited amount of time to do something righteous with your life. All of us do. In the, in the fact that these people who are in power, who create definitions on, you know, or limits on what we can become and what we can do, well, you know, you have to move beyond that and understand that this is your one-shot life and it's on you to make it mean something. And that's whether you're in prison or on the street. You know, I'm not waiting to, I, you know, you know, some, you know, magical day when the door is open to live my life. I'm living my life right now. I'm doing what I feel is right right now. You know, you know, and that's, you know, that's the thing about it. If you, you know, you want to be my comrade, if you want to be somebody, you know, who, you know, you know, uh, uh, circulate in my circle, then that's the understanding that I, uh, uh, that I have about who I am. You know what I mean? We in the same boat. You know, that is, we on, we on planet worse and, it, and it's a hell of a place to be. I mean, you got kids right now walking through deserts trying to get over to this country in the middle of the fucking ocean, man. Kids in Syria right now sleeping in mud, eating mud. You know, so I'm not under the, you know, uh, 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 the impression that I'm somehow, the, you know, in the worst possible situation you can be in on this planet. I don't buy it. You know, 
So, you know, that's, you know, what I want to, you know, I just don't want people to come at me as, you know, uh, woe is, you know, woe is Keith. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, poor Keith. You know what I mean? You know, this is a hell of a planet, man. It's fierce. You know, and you have to be, you know, strong and you have to, you know, uh, 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 um, you know, uphold your convictions. You have to be, you know, clear. You have to, you know, uh, be educated. You have to, you know, arm yourself. You have to, you know, uh, uh, be intelligent. You know, and, you know, that takes a, a, a community, that takes a, a effort, not just that, that you, something that you just can't do by yourself. You know, you got to be on circles. You know what I mean? It, with the, you know, you know, you have to, you know, build communities. You have to, you know, you know, you know, reach beyond yourself in order to make your life mean something, you know? And so, you know, yeah, you know, so that's the, you know, last of, you know, our exchange together. Yeah, that's a good, you know, good point to, you know, leave on, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me and with the audience. No and I wish you so much solidarity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same here. And I just want to, you know, also uh, acknowledge the young people at, at RAM there in New York. You know, they're the ones who uh, initiated this month of solidarity. And I just want them to know that my heart goes out to them. And I'm really appreciative of them taking the time to, you know, involve themselves in my situation. And hopefully through our exchanges, you know, they've been able to understand that I feel the same way about them in this, this, this struggle and that, uh, you know, you know, putting our ears together, the least we can do is change ourselves. We not, might not be able to change this system, you know, because these people got nuclear bombs, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's some perspective. <laughs> you know, but... <laughs> we can change ourselves, though, and that's what Victor Frankl said. When you're confronted with circumstances, you cannot change the challenges to change yourself. And so, I encourage, you know, you know, you know, each and every one to, you know, to take up that challenge, man, because that's the most important thing: to change yourself, to not be a slave, and you know, at the end of the day, not to be on the side of the executioners, man. You know, yeah. All right, my friend. Well, thank um, good you. Good to talk to you. And. Uh, you know, maybe we get the opportunity to do it again sometime. I would love that. Right? This is The Final Straw, and I'm Bursa Goodness. This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.com.